Something huge is happening right now in North Africa. Something so big, the last time anything like it happened, it sparked this. The horses? Oh my god. Uh, people on horseback charging in. Oh my god. And this here. And over here. And this right here. Yes, that would be the Arab Spring. A revolution that took down the governments of Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Syria and Yemen. And now, people are flooding the streets in Tunisia once again. But this time, Tunisians have a different gripe with their government and it's because of this man. But what's he done? Have a listen to this. Attacks on sub-Saharan migrants as a whole have spiked in Tunisia ever since the country's president gave an incendiary speech in which he said migration was part of a plot to replace the Arabic population of Tunisia with an African population. Okay. So why exactly are President Kais Said's comments such a big problem? For one thing, it's that they bear no resemblance to the truth. Or if you want to be really generous, like taking liberties generous, you could say his comments are based on only partial truth. There are 12 million people in Tunisia, of which 20,000 are black migrants slash asylum seekers. We also know that Tunisia is a transit point for a lot of the migrants trying to get into Europe. So how are 20,000 people, many waiting for a boat to take them across to Spain or France, going to outbreed a majority population of 12 million people? Let's forget that for a minute and examine something else. If you take a cursory look at the population of Tunisia, it has one of the oldest populations in Africa. A US State Department report on the country's population back in 2012 was that it had a 1.2% birth rate. That's 1.2%. The idea that 20,000 largely transitory black migrants are a real demographic threat to a population of 12 million people who refuse to have more than 17.7 .7 births per 1,000 people is so laughable, it's sad. And then it's laughable all over again. But what is more egregious about President Kais Said's statements is the lack of humility in the face of historical fact. Take a trip down memory lane with me. For this trip, we're going well beyond living memory now. Oh yes. Here we go. Now here is an image I can almost guarantee most people watching wouldn't have ever seen before. It's an image of Abu Bakr ibn Umar. And it's an image you can see on a 1413 Portland chart by the Mallorcan cartographer Mishya de Viadestes, purporting to show Europe, Asia and Northern Africa. Who was Abu Bakr ibn Umar. He was a Moor, or to be pedantic, a blacker Moor, that is to say, the indigenous inhabitants of northern Saharan Africa. But just who was he exactly? Abu Bakr ibn Umar was an emir or lord of the Almoravid dynasty and reputed to have founded the Moroccan imperial city of Marrakesh. He is also said to have been the conqueror, according to Arab accounts, of the capital of the Ghana Empire known as Kumbi Saleh, the founder of a North African nation, a black African Berber. Uh, what are you say, boy? Berbers was in black? Everybody knows they had nothing to do with you, black Africans. Why, yes, that's right, Cletus. I, for one, am no longer listening to this Afrocentrist hogwash. Hmm. 
I can see you. You're still here, listening, watching. Okay, Cletus and Boris, let me tell you another story. One that might help you better see my point. It's the story of a man called Tariq Ibn Ziyad al-Jibral. Who was he? He was another Moorish conqueror. And it was Tariq, an Islamized black African, who in 711 AD led a major invasion into Spain from Gibraltar. We know Tariq was a black African, despite deliberate attempts to muddy the waters because Al Idrisi, a cartographer and Egyptologist who lived in Sicily several hundred years after Tariq, referenced him as Tariq bin Abid Ala bin Wanamu al Zanati. Al Zanati referring to the Zanata people of Northwest Africa who are by and large a black African people. Fun fact, Gibraltar of the coast of Spain is named after Tariq ibn Ziyad al Jibral. What's important to note is this, in both the cases of the Umayyad Caliphate of which ibn Ziyad was a part of and in the case of the Almoravids who came after, both being Islamic empires it's undoubted that large parts of their armies, whether consisting of free men or slaves and mercenaries, were led by black North Africans. No. Not happy, Cletus. Boris. What about you, President Kais? Alright then, well, we'll just move on anyway, because there is the huge nation of Mauritania to come to of which the indigenous population are known colloquially as Haritans. And the Haritans look something like this. A quick look into the Haritans will show that they are indisputably the natives of the region today known as Mauritania, which is in northern western Africa and that only through Arab conquests have they either been pushed further south into places like Chad and northern Nigeria where they intermingle with the Hausas and Fulanis who look like this. But by and large, the Haritans today have been made second class citizens on their own home soil. Today the Haritans are still the largest single ethnic bloc in Mauritania but that block is only 40% and diminishing. But our trip down memory lane doesn't stop with them though. Travel further back in time with me to a place known as Ancient Rome. The people who in fact gave us the name Moor through their word Maori, which actually is in their word, but that of the ancient Greeks. Their word too is Maori or Maros, which means dark or can denote the blackness of a shadow or metaphorically death and the dead. Most definitely though, we know that when the Greeks used this to identify the native inhabitants of North Africa, they used a word that to them meant black skinned. But here, the waters have been muddied and deliberately. Why? Well, you'll have to answer that after you see the evidence for yourself. Revisionists in modern times have attempted to erase or downplay the part of this word that might conjure up the image of black Africans. They claim things along the lines that the name Maori was used by the Maoris for themselves and had nothing to do with the Greeks or Romans. Even more nonsensical is that the word applies to dark skinned, effectively tanned, Caucasoid peoples those who are the majority of today's Berber population. Briefly, let us examine these claims. The Greeks were an olive to dark skinned Southern European peoples. There is no way they are calling a people half a shade darker than themselves dark or better yet black. If they weren't actually that black. Secondly, Thanks to the likes of former University of Columbia academic Dana Reynolds, now Dana Reynolds Marniche of the University of Chicago, we know that Neo-Roman writers described the Berber population of Northern Africa as dark skinned and woolly haired. Among these writers were Martial, Silius Italicus, Corippus and Procopius. And as if that wasn't enough for proof, 
we have reliefs and artwork from the Roman era which depicts the Maori of North Africa. Look closely at this image. The people depicted as cavalry are the Maori and they are routing the Romanian tribe of Dacia on behalf of a Roman general called Quietus. They largely have features that you would find among groups of people popularly called black today with curled locks and prominent prognathism. For those who don't know, prognathism simply means a puffy jawline with thickish lips, a general characteristics of many black Africans today. Now take a look at this ancient depiction of a Libyan man, complete with almost a Rastafarian afro and quite sizable lips. Oh, and there's this representation of Hannibal of Carthage on the back of a recently discovered coin which some claim is only evidence of the fetishization of blacks in ancient North Africa. The revisionists get even more ridiculous. They maintain that all this isn't enough evidence to prove that there was ever a sizable black African population indigenous to North Africa. E.A.J. Honigman makes the most ridiculous version of this claim I have heard yet. He claims that Othello's ethnic background is ambiguous. Yes, that's Shakespeare's Othello. He says this because according to him, Renaissance representations of the Moor were quote, vague, varied, inconsistent and contradictory, close quote. Honigman is in such denial that he even asserts that when Rodrigo refers to Othello derogatorily in the play, as thick lips. It is merely an insult and need not be taken literally. Never mind Othello being called sooty bosomed in the play. Never mind that the consensus from the first moments the play was performed through till today was that Othello was a black moor and not just a tawny or what some call a white moor. No, Honigman claims that because characters refer to Othello as hailing from Barbary, which was another term used to refer to North Africans. That therefore means he could easily just have been a dark skinned Caucasian type. Without gaining my own PhD in whatever it is Dr. Honigman supposedly has a PhD in, let's try and test this hypothesis using basic logic. Here is what the majority of modern day Berbers look like after a little over 2000 years of Persian, Greek, Roman, Arab and French conquests and intermingling with indigenous Berbers. Here are what Italians look like and for the most part, I imagine I've always looked like. Now remember that the play Othello is about the Moor of Venice. Why is Shakespeare writing a play clearly about racial differences and love when his Moor looks just like everybody else in Venice? Yet Honigman has written a whole book about this nonsensical theory. We have reams and reams of textual evidence from even as recently as the 1500s that despite successive conquests, displacement and enslavement and absorption of the original inhabitants of North Africa into a mass of fairer skinned people, a sizable enough contingency of black Africans indigenous to the region remained in North Africa across Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia and Egypt. So much so that Sardinia by Italy was said to have been ruled by a confluence of four Moorish kings who were defeated later on by Christian European kings. All of this suffices to say this, at some point in relatively recent history, North Africa was at least in a significant way a region populated not scantily by black Africans it could easily have been 60-40 black African or 50-50, but not considerably less. North Africa has always been a crossroads of civilizations. Now this, whether you think the original Moors or Berbers were as black as coal or just Italian dark, today they are 1% of the Tunisian population, whilst the rest are of Arab descent. Everybody agrees on this. Of the decidedly black African Haritans, 
who are just about still the biggest ethnic bloc in Mauritania, Wikipedia's entry on them agrees. It says this, the Umayyads were the first Arab Muslims to enter Mauritania. During the Islamic conquests, they made incursions into Mauritania and were present in the region by the end of the 7th century. Many Berber tribes in Mauritania fled the arrival of the Arabs to the Gao region in Mali. And get this, slavery was only legally abolished in Mauritania in 1981. 1981. And no prizes for guessing who the slaves were. The native Haritans. If you want to know how North Africa eventually became Arab or olive skin dominant, look at Mauritania today. Piecemeal ethnic subjugation and cleansing is the order of the day. But let it be known, there is no one square mile or inch of the African continent that black Africans are not indigenous to. Not one. Not from Tunisia through to Cape Town and that includes Madagascar. So then, a question to President Kais Saeed, who claims that black Africans are replacing the native Arabs of Tunisia and other North African nations. Who exactly has been doing the replacing, and still is doing the replacing? In the face of truth and history, Mr. President, let your words be salted with a little humility and decorum. Humility and a little decorum. Thank you once again for clicking on and watching this presentation. There's a very important word that we've deliberately not used in this video. It's a word anyone talking about the history of black African people in and around North Africa always uses. It's a fake intellectual word that suggests black people have never been out of Africa or anywhere north of the Sahara before slavery or Islam. You might well have heard it in a clip or two I played earlier, I can't exactly remember that far back now. But I myself made sure not to utter the word because I can't stand it. I think it's a meaningless word that is actually quite denigrating. Keep an eye out for a video on that topic in the near future. If you think you know what that word is, go ahead and visit our Instagram page at trillblackgram, that's at trillblackgram, drop the word in the comment section beside either our Kwame Nkrumah shirt or our Sphinx shirt, both here on the screen. And the first person to guess the word correctly will get the shirt of his or her choice in their chosen size for free. Just follow us on Instagram and be the first to identify the word correctly and the shirt of your choice is yours. We think both shirts look fire and we can't wait to give away whichever one you choose. Finally, please go ahead, like our video and subscribe. We need you to do this so we can reach good people like you far and wide with our message of knowledge and empowerment. From True Black to you, no doubt. Thanks again for watching and remember to rep black right. Count me out, Demma, count me out. Hold it down, Mia, hold it down. One man, Ami Mia, hold it down. Cool it down, Mia, cool it down. Cut the flight, then I, cut the side, and I, cut the vibe, then I, feel the high, then I.